<laughs> oh, I love this place. <laughs> Good morning once again. God bless you all. Sorry for all the racket there. All of a sudden I realized I didn't turn my mic off, and you don't want to hear me singing. And maybe that was better than all the racket of taking it out of my pocket. <laughs> we are at the end of Exodus. This is going to be our last part in our series going through the book of Exodus. And Lord willing, next week, next Sunday, we're going to be uh, taking some time to think about the Lord's resurrection from the dead. And after that, it's Leviticus. So it, the Lord's timing is always, I didn't plan any of that, it just kind of happens. And, and that's the Lord's hand of providence once again. We're going to be in the book of Exodus chapter 34. And um, under God, I've prepared this message, thinking about it, praying about it, reading. And I honestly don't know if I'm going to fill all the time that's been given to me. And that's okay, because it's, it's, a, it's the least bit artificial, isn't it? The pastor gets up there, and he always finishes at 12, maybe 12.05, but never more. <laughs> it seems kind of artificial and cookie cutter. I mean, this is supposed to be from God here. This is God's word we're relaying. So I'm just going to preach the word that God gives me, and um, where we end is where we end. That's okay. And we leave here edified, right? So just by way of review... The book of Exodus is about this deliverance from bondage. It's about the nation of Israel entombed in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And God raised up a deliverer, his name is Moses. And this man Moses, he leaves the courts of Egypt, he leaves royalty to come down and to help his Hebrew brethren. He's, he's the, the man that God has raised up to do this thing and, of course, he's rejected at first. Do you remember? They rejected him. Who made you a judge or an arbiter over us? And nevertheless, though, I mean, God works with this man, and the time frame is just enormous. He, he leaves Egypt. Forty years he leaves. He's gone from Egypt. After 40 years of intensive postgraduate training, we'll say, off in the wilderness, God has him ready now to do something. And he comes back, and through spectacular sign miracles... He delivered Israel with a great deliverance, sign wonders, miracles, spectacular. He teaches the people, he intercedes for the people, delivers the people, and brings them the law. That Moses sounds a lot like our Jesus. Jesus left the high courts of the third heaven to come to the earth, to be born of a woman, born under the law, born of a Hebrew virgin, came to his brethren, came to his own, John tells us, and his own received him not. And Stephen, in his great speech, Acts chapter 7, he brings this out to the religious leaders. This Moses that you worship, you guys, you guys want to follow Moses, you want to follow the letter of his law, you, you think that you're disciples of Moses. Look how God operates. God has sent another Moses. His name's Jesus of Nazareth. And the same thing's happening all over again. His brethren are rejecting him. And Jesus could bless us with an infinite blessing infinitely more than Moses ever could. Mo by Moses came the law, Jesus said. John 7, 19. Through the, Moses brought you the law. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. That we want to talk about this this morning. That law could do nothing but condemn us. It showed us that we were, we were sinners. We could never do thing one to make ourselves right and acceptable in the eyes of God. The law was useful in one thing. It at least showed us that. Remember we talked about being married to Mr. Law? Remember that? Who wants to be married to Mr. Law? He's the most ungrateful person you've ever seen. He can't do anything right. He only speaks when he wants to condemn you. My supper's cold. <laughs> he comes home. Mr. Law comes home from work. The house is dirty. The supper's cold. I don't like this. I don't like that. You don't look good. On and on it goes. The law. Who wants to be married to that kind of person? And Paul tells us in Romans, the seventh chapter, the law has died. It's been crucified. You're not married to Mr. Law anymore. You're free to be married to somebody else. The Lord Jesus himself. That's why we are, together, the, the body and bride of Christ. And Paul talks about that, doesn't he, in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Ephesians 5, around verse 25. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak, of, I speak of Christ and the church. We're the body and bride of Christ. Well, in our narrative here in the book of Exodus, Moses went up Mount Sinai and he received the law, the, the, the Ten Commandments, the law engraved on tablets of stone. And I think that Moses must have been pretty strong to carry these tablets down from the mountain. But he carried these tablets, 
written with the finger of God. God himself wrote on them. Coming down from the mountain, the people were already worshiping false gods. They were already, uh, had developed for themselves a false, blasphemous, pagan religious system. No doubt heavily influenced by their experience in Egypt. Couldn't get Egypt out of these people. Stephen talks about that too in Acts chapter 7. Mo and by the time Moses comes down, came down from the mountain and he saw what was going on, he basically smashed those tablets at the foot of the mountain. He said, I'm not even going to approach you with the word of God. He just smashed them right there. And it's quite comical, actually, if you read ancient Jewish expositors on this. They want Moses to be, uh, s they want him to be flawless. They want him to be spotless. He would never get angry and break the law like that, right? And the ancient rabbis had stories about how, uh, well, the, the letters of the law, they were engraved by the finger of God, right? So the tablets weren't that heavy. And when Moses saw what was happening, well, God just kind of filled in those letters, and they became too heavy for Moses, he had to drop them. <laughs> That's a funny story, right? But they wanted so very much to protect Moses' reputation. But the text makes it very clear that Moses, the meekest man, he just got good and angry with these people. He, he smashed them on purpose. Very angry. But... Um, he interceded for the people. He pleaded for the people. He reminded God, as though God needed reminding, that God had made some promises to Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God said, that's right. And, and he relented. He, he would not destroy the nation because he made some promises, and God doesn't break his promises. But look at chapter 34. Look what God tells Moses here. Chapter 34, verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So Moses, uh, he's going to go up with these tablets that he, has, that he has carved out, and God's going to write on them once again. And uh, let's go to verse 28 now. And let's see what happened with Moses as he went up the mountain again. Verse 28, and we're going to read to verse 35, so right to the end. Let's read what happened. So he, that was, that's Moses, he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, and neither ate any bread or drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the Ten Commandments. That's God wrote on the tablets the Ten Commandments. And it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand, when he came down the mountain that Moses did not know that his skin, the skin of his face, shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them the commandments, all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw Moses, or saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put a veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Very mysterious thing happening here. First of all, Moses went up that mountain, and he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights, and he ate and drank nothing, no food, no water. Now, you and I know you can't go more than a couple days without water. So we know that something miraculous happened here. Moses was 100% sustained physically, spiritually, mentally by God, completely by God. And that reminds us of the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus, at the, at the very dawn of his ministry, he went out after baptism into the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights fasting. And the message is the same. Both men relied completely, totally, 100% on God to uphold and sustain them. And we say, wow, that's, that's a pretty miraculous thing. Uh, I wish I could have faith like that. I wish uh, that I could trust in God to uphold and sustain me like that. Well, guess what, friends? You do. We do. Colossians 1.17 says that it, in Christ, all things consist, or all things are held together in Christ. And you and I, we just simply don't reflect enough on that. You are being held in existence right now, body, soul, and spirit, by God. You are able to put two thoughts together in your head right now because God is upholding and sustaining that even. I believe that God is even holding propositions together 
in any reasoning process. God is holding mathematical truths together. God is holding everything together. There's nothing greater than God. There's nothing more eternal than God. There's nothing more ultimate than God. And we need him for moment-by-moment moment existence. We simply do. Our heart continues to beat because he is there doing that. So when we read stories like this, yes, we should be uh, amazed. We should be uh, in awe of God and what he's doing. But let's, let's not forget that moment-by-moment, moment he's, he's still holding everything together, including us. You know, He's that fantastic. We don't just evaporate from existence because he is the one holding us in existence. He's upholding and sustaining all things. Notice in our text here, we're going to come back to it, when Moses went in to talk with God, the veil came off, and it's face-to-face -face with God. You know, and I believe he's, he's there interfacing with the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ. The veil's off. It's face-to-face. -face. And yet when he talks with Israel, the veil goes on to cover that glory. And it says the people were afraid. And they saw his face shone like that. They were afraid. And that reminds me of Jesus, too. Jesus, the, the better Moses, the infinitely upgraded Moses, he went up a mountain too, remember? He said to his disciples, there's some standing here that will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God coming in power. And in less than a week, he took Peter, James, and John up a, up a mountain. And there he was, what, transfigured before them. And his face shone too, remember? And, P and Peter writes through Mark, mind you. You read this in Mark's gospel. Mark got this from Peter. He said his face shone and his, his garments became whiter than, than, a, than any fuller could ever make them. No, no laundromat could ever bleach clothing like this. And Peter was, what? Afraid. Just like Israel here, you see. Peter didn't even know. And Peter said some nonsense things, didn't he? <laughs> it's good that we're here. Let's make some tents for you and Elijah and Moses. You know? It says he, he didn't know what to say. But we can see kind of a parallel. Isn't that interesting? Interesting parallel here. Well, we're going to see that this second giving of the law is the second time Moses is coming down now with these tablets. And his face shining, the one who made intercession, coming down, giving the law a second time. This is a shadow, a type, a prefigurement of Jesus giving the new covenant. This is still Moses we're talking about giving the same old covenant, just a re-giving. But Jesus comes, the intercessor, the one whose face shone, he comes down from, well, from the third heaven, doesn't he? And he gives a new covenant, a better covenant, infinitely better. So you go to, flip ahead in your Bibles now, let's go to 2 Corinthians. And of course, as we move ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we must realize that by the time we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we've just fast-forwarded in time from Moses all the way back or all the way forward, rather, more than 1,400 years. You know, we've, we're, just a second ago, we're, we got Moses. We're talking about Moses. He's coming down from the mountain. His face is shining. He's got tablets. 1,400 years later, we're now, we're in the New Testament. Jesus has come. Jesus has died. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. And I guess we have to call him his most brilliant apostle, namely the apostle Paul, the most successful and powerful missionary and theologian the church has ever known, now he's writing to us. And he's reflecting on some of these things. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let's read what Paul says here, okay? Let's begin at verse 7. He says this, But if the ministry of death, written and engraven on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For if what was made glorious, he said, for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that excels. For what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Now what's Paul telling us? He's saying, look, that old covenant was spectacular. That was God interfacing with man. That was God speaking to people in power. That's God giving his law to the people through his mediator, his man Moses, the, the miracle maker. He said that was a pretty glorious thing. 
Moses came down from the mountain with the law, his face shining, glorious. But Paul says, when you lay that beside the thing that Jesus did, it, it really looks like not much. It, the glory is completely eclipsed in every respect. I mean, especially, I would say, uh, with respect to who it is that is bringing down this covenant with us. And the writer of the Hebrews goes to great lengths to talk about this to us. The writer of the Hebrews has one thing to tell us, and it's this. Jesus Christ is better. That's the whole theme of the book of Hebrews, that whole 13 chapters. Jesus is better. He's better than angels. He's better than the law. Yes, you know, horror of horrors. <laughs> he's better than Moses. Yes, Jewish folks, he's better than Moses. Much better. He said that, the guy that, you know, the house may be glorious, it may be a glorious house, but the guy who built it has much more glory. He has much more to be, to be proud of. He's the architect. And guess who built Moses? Who empowered him, commissioned him, put wisdom in that man? Jesus did that. He's so much more glorious. And the, the covenant that Jesus makes with us is infinitely better than that old covenant. Paul tells us that that, that, that covenant is passing away. Look at verse 11. For what for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Two weeks ago I spoke on this topic the, of the relationship between the believer who believes the gospel and what's his relationship to the Mosaic law. And I would say that the law has been crucified. We're free to be married to somebody else now. And in fact, friends, we're actually called to a higher moral standard. Now we've got to get right with God in our hearts. And he makes that possible because... He makes you something new on the inside. The writer of the Hebrews says this in, in the eighth chapter of his prophecy. He, he, has, he, has, he has made the first covenant obsolete. That Mosaic covenant, obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And we are not to be placed underneath that old Mosaic law ever again. Look please at verse 12 now. We're still, still in 2 Corinthians 3. Look at verse 12. This is wonderful. I'm going to read the next few verses here. Paul says this, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. L listen to the brilliant Apostle Paul, right? Uh, and let's just face it, let's remember, Paul is brilliant, but it's only because he knows Jesus, in whom is deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But Paul could look upon Old Testament events. He's thinking about Moses coming down from the mountain with, an old, with this old covenant. Paul could look at the, these actual historical events, and under God and by God's Spirit, Paul could apply a, a metaphorical understanding to these things. These are real events. There really was a Moses. It really came down with real tablets. But we get a metaphorical application of these historical events. He tells us that the New Testament, the New Covenant, it's glorious. It's way more glorious than what Moses brought down. But that glory is veiled. It's veiled, and Paul talks about it in the fourth chapter. Uh, Satan has blinded the eyes of them who, that don't believe. And in, in context, Paul here in the third chapter, he's talking about Israel, his own beloved nation of Israel. You read Romans 9, 10, and 11. Paul is in anguish for his brethren, the nation of Israel. He says, I could wish that I would be cut off for, for my brethren's sake and estranged from Christ. And Paul himself sounds a lot like Moses, doesn't he? Remember, Moses said, God, blot me out of your book and save the nation. You know, punish me. Paul, Paul has the same spirit, you see. That new covenant that, that Jesus made offered first to Israel and now to everybody, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. For the most part, that glorious gospel, that glorious new covenant is veiled. It's veiled. Israel has become blinded to this thing. That new covenant is very much like the Lord Jesus himself. And oftentimes in the Bible, 
It's hard to tell. I mean, there's some places where it sounds like the Word of God, the Word that we read, is God. There are places like that. Paul said the Scripture was preached beforehand to Abraham, and in just in a single breath, it sounds like the Scripture is talking, and, and it actually is a somebody, the Word of God. Well, we know the Word of God is Jesus, you know, God's ultimate revelation of himself. That new covenant now veiled so that Israel can't really perceive it, can't see it clearly. It reminds me of Jesus. He comes in the days of his flesh during his earthly ministry, and he looks just like everybody else. We talked about that. You know, God in his wisdom, he sends, a, he sends his son into the world. He's born of a woman, born under the law in the fullness of time, but he, he's born in a manger. He's not born in some court someplace. He, he, as a little baby coming into the world, it's not the Pharisees or the Sadducees or any other religious leaders. It's not Herod or Pilate or anybody else who gets to come and, and, and be introduced to the baby. It's, it's some shepherds, you know? And then a little bit, a couple of years later, it's some wise men from the east who get to come and, and bow down and worship. He, in God's wisdom, he has, he has veiled his glory in Christ. And he looks at, and looks and he sounds like everybody. You know? Until you start listening to the man, and then you realize that, he, that there's wisdom here. It's supernatural wisdom. And you see the sign miracles that he performs, and you realize there's something very special about this carpenter from Nazareth. But nevertheless, if you didn't want to draw near to him, if you didn't want to hear him, you didn't want to think about his miracles, then he just looks like anybody else. And he, his, his glory was veiled, very much like the new covenant is veiled from the eyes of Israel. Our text tells us that the veil is taken away in Christ. Verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And this is something I will always preach. I'll preach two things always, consistently, every time, just about. The cross of Christ, which is the only way we're going to be saved, the only way to have our sin debt atoned for, and the fact that we need God moment by moment for day-to-day -day existence. It's God who enlightens the mind of man. It's God who allows us to think. God knows everything. He's rational. He's logical. He thinks. He doesn't contradict himself. He's the knower with a capital K. We're just derivative re-knowers. We're small k knowers. We know things because our self-conscious God knows things. He knows all things. You see that? And we absolutely need him for day-to-day -day existence. And Jesus Christ, the one in whom are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, therefore becomes the answer, the only answer, the ultimate answer to every question, all questions worth knowing. Jesus is the answer. You know, can I just give you an example here? I mean, you, I mean, you think you can reason autonomously without God's help? You really think you can do that? I hope you don't think that. I hope you don't think you're going to reach conclusions because of your own inherent brilliance. No. And maybe I've mentioned this before, maybe I haven't, but I'm going to mention it now. There was a, a brilliant tactician and political leader by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. That man was brilliant. He was no fool. And he refused to give God the glory, and God says, well, okay, I'll just remove the reason that I gave you in the first place. I'll, you're just going to run around like an animal for seven years, have fun out there in your backyard eating grass. And after seven years of that kind of thing, God returned his reason to him. And he bowed down and worshipped the God of heaven. You know? And would to God that our own nation of people who are thinking people who can balance their checkbooks and drive cars and hold down jobs, would to God that they would have just enough reason to recognize Jesus Christ for who he really, really is. And they would make their own lives infinitely better and those around them infinitely better, wouldn't they? Jesus is the answer to all questions worth knowing for sure. I want you to know that the blindness that's taking part in Israel right now and the resulting rejection of their Messiah is all in God's plan. Paul talks about this, you know. I think about Israel. I hope you think about Israel sometimes. You know, you read the book of Romans. Thank God for Romans. One day, in about 10 years, we'll probably get there. <laughs> We're very happy that Paul never went to Rome to found a church there. Say, why not, John? Why, why aren't you happy? Oh, because, because he didn't found the church there. He could write a letter to them saying, guys, I'm going to get there one day. I'm gonna, we're going to visit with each other, and we're, and we're going to encourage each other. But just so that there's no surprises when I get there, I'm going to give you a letter outlining how I preach the gospel. See, if Paul had got there 
and preach the gospel, they would have already known how he does it. But because he didn't go there to found the church, he can write them a letter. This is how I understand this thing. It's beautiful. Systematic theology in 16 chapters. And three of those chapters are donated 100% to Israel. Is, the nation of Israel is not some little postscript. It's not, like, it's not like Paul's writing really important things and then figures, well, you know, I may as well say a thing or two about Israel. <laughs> it's not like that. He's going to donate three solid chapters to Israel. And in those chapters, Paul says, I want you to know that Israel's rejection of her Messiah is all in the plan of God. They, they, they don't recognize Messiah right now, and God has, has this already planned. It's already in a, it's taken account of. It's all of God. Because Israel re rejected her Messiah, betrayed and crucified him, had him crucified by the Gentiles, salvation could come to the world. And that's why Paul says, don't you boast against the tree, meaning Israel. Don't you branches boast against that tree. Some of those branches were broken off, you know, and you got grafted in there, you Gentiles. But God can put the native branches back in that tree. He can do that, and he's going to do that. It's the tree that upholds you. You don't uphold the tree. Paul tells us that the blindness in Israel right now, it's partial and it's temporary. This is what he says in Romans 11.25. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Jesus has to reign and rule in Israel, in a Jewish kingdom. He's going to do that, you know. He's going to reign and rule on, his, on the throne of his father, David. God hasn't forgotten Israel. Paul wants you to know that. In, in fact, Paul says, I'd like to introduce to you Exhibit A. You know, in the courtroom, they, they bring up a little bag of something. Maybe there's a gun in there or something. Exhibit A, Your Honor. <laughs> Paul says, I'd like to introduce to you Exhibit A, me. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm from the, you know, I'm from the stock of Israel. And I got saved in spectacular fashion. I want to end with these last few verses in 2 Corinthians 3. Look at verse 17. This is beautiful. Verse 17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. One thing I love about the Bible, it's so not very wordy. I just hate reading, you know, you read a book, you read a book on philosophy, you read a book on history, and, and, and by the time the guy gets done, you know, 18 pages later, you're like, I think I know what you're saying, but you probably could have said that in two paragraphs. Why did you have to be so wordy? <laughs> you ever read books like that? God says profoundly beautiful, helpful, encouraging things, and he uses very few beautiful words to do it. Beautiful words. Look at those, look at those two verses. The Lord is the spirit where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom where the Spirit is. And in verse 18, he talks about the sanctifying work of the Spirit in our lives. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. You know, guys, that's a constant theme in the Bible. Freedom, freedom, walk in freedom. You ever see people outside with placards and sandwich boards protesting, down with freedom, down with freedom, we don't like freedom. No, no one ever talks like that. We want freedom, and Jesus came to set us free to make you and me free. The Bible's good news. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. We were all slaves of sin. We were on the open market being sold into one kind of sin or another. And Jesus came into the world and he bought us with a price, the Bible tells us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you were bought with a price, you're not your own, therefore you glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He purchased us. You were bought, you were redeemed, and therefore you have freedom in Christ. You were free from sin, purchased back from sin, never to be sold into sin again. Kind of like Moses. This whole theme of the book of Exodus, and God, through Moses, gets the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt and into freedom. And that's what we think about as Christians. One of, the, one, of the, one of the most encouraging things about the gospel is that we can walk in freedom now. We're not slaves of sin anymore. I mean, I talk to people who are addicted to all kinds of horrible addictions. Just name them all. And you talk to them, I mean, Gil, you and I, we go downtown, we, we talk to people in those bars, try to offer them prayer and something hot to eat, and you ask them, what can we pray for? Can we pray for you? Would you like it? I like how Gil says it. It would be our honor to pray for you. 
and 90%, maybe 90, Gil, ask, I need, would you please pray for me? I need to be free from booze. I need to be free from this addiction or that addiction. They, the unsaved know that they're addicted to things that are harmful to them, and they can't get free. And Jesus comes and he liberates us from these horrible things. I like what Paul says here in verse 18, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord being transformed into the same image. Remember just a few minutes ago we said that when Moses talked to God, he was unveiled. And Paul says we are unveiled, with unveiled face we talk to the Lord. You see the connection there? There's no mediating agency anymore, guys. Jesus, when he died on that cross, he tore the veil that opened the way to the holiest of holies, and we talked about that through our journey and through Exodus. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews in chapter 4 could say, we now have bold access to the throne of grace, and that's why in the 10th chapter he says, let us draw near with a pure conscience, with full assurance, no doubting, no wavering. Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners. And he has left us now with bold access to himself. He invites us in, an open invitation into the holiest of holies, into the presence of God. Let us draw near with unveiled face. Moses is kind of like a shadow and type of us as well. Fully human and yet invited into the presence of God. With unveiled face, we have fellowship with God our Savior. Look at what he says in verse 18. But we all with, we all with unveiled face. You know, there's no such thing as a two-tiered Christianity. There's no small people in the kingdom of God. Did you know that? You know, a lot of people, they, they pat me on the back. John, we really like your messages. You're a real good guy. You're a great pastor, you know, this and that and the other thing. And, well, you don't know what really goes on in my heart and mind through the week and, and even moments before preaching. I really appreciate the, the pat on the back. I appreciate it. Love you all very much. Thank you for the encouragement. But you don't think that the guy standing up here is more important than any of you, do you? I hope you don't think like that. There's no small people in the kingdom. We all, with unveiled face, we all have bold access to the God who inhabits eternity. All of you, from the youngest to the oldest, we all have bold access. And notice this. We are all being transformed, all being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ. He is working on us. He's working on all of us, not just some of us, not just the smart ones, not just the special ones. He's working on the whole body of Christ to make us what we're supposed to be, all of us, every one of us, all the time, drawing us into his presence and changing us. We call that the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And God gives up on nobody. You get that? And I remember, friends, I remember, can I just share something? It's kind of private. But you won't tell anybody, right? <laughs> it's being recorded. It's going on the internet. <laughs> just share with you something very... I got saved at the age of 20. I didn't... I was obsessed with sports since the age of 14. So I didn't do a lot of dumb things like drugs and booze and all that. I didn't do a lot of that dumb stuff because I wanted to be an athlete. I got saved at the age of 20, but I didn't have anyone to mentor me. I didn't have a church. All I had was a Bible. I knew the Bible was true, 100% true. But for the first couple of years after conversion, I navigated into some pretty stupid, sinful things. And I hope that doesn't lower your estimation of me. But when Lindy and I decided it was time to really get right with God, as a couple saved, sealed Christians, you know, who had done stupid things, we decided to get baptized. And the Bible says if you draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. And that was like the turning point. And God began really working at us. And I look back years later and I go, why did I ever think that thing, that particular thing was entertaining? That was that's sinful and stupid. I, I would never even consider that kind of thing as entertainment now. And the point I'm trying to make is, it doesn't matter where you, at, where you are at right now as a Christian. He's working on you. He really is. And he began a good work in you. And he began a good work in me. And he won't drop you. He'll keep working at you. And he's going to make you what you're supposed to be. He will transform you into the same image. Throughout the rest of the book of Exodus, it's very, very encouraging. We're not going to read it. We've already read about the tabernacle and the furniture that goes into the tabernacle. And the rest of the book of Exodus is just now the construction of that, that tabernacle and the furniture that went into it. But I love chapter 36. It says, the people were moved to give. 
They gave, they sacrificed, they gave their material goods to the building of the tabernacle, and Moses had to say, stop, we've got way too much. And they built that tabernacle, and God dwelt with Israel in that tabernacle. Today, under this special new covenant, you know where God dwells? Not in a tabernacle made with hands. In his wisdom, in his grace, in his mercy, he's, de he's decided to dwell in the people whom he loves. That's us. You say, I, I sure don't feel very, I don't feel very holy, I don't feel very, right, I shouldn't have blown up at that guy, I shouldn't have done this or that other thing. You think God still loves me? Yes, <laughs> he loves you. He loves you enough to dwell in you, to walk with you, to never forsake you, to, to convict you. When you've done things wrong, that conscience will speak to you. But he loves you enough to forgive you, to get you up on your feet again, and to move you along this road we call sanctification, make you what you're supposed to be. That is a God I'm going to preach as long as there's breath in these lungs. That's a God worth loving and worshiping, right? Isn't that true? Yeah. Well, I'm going to offer a word of prayer here, and, um, and then we're going to be done. Father God, in the name of Christ Jesus the Lord, we thank you so much for this uh, special morning. We could come first day of the week to remember you, Lord, to open your word and to think about you, your more glorious covenant that you have made with mankind. We thank you so much, our awesome God, for loving us enough to send your son Jesus into the world to lead a sinless life and to pay our sin debt. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of the Holy Spirit to walk with us and to dwell in us, to lead us and guide us and to transform us uh, into the image of your dear Son. And we pray now, Lord God, that you will seal us, seal in us the, the profound truths we heard today. Bless and protect, please, every dear saint that's here today. May our walks be fruitful and may you be honored in our lives and all that we say, do, and think. In the blessed, mighty, precious name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen and amen. Okay. God bless you all.